Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to have you all here today. It's a fantastic Sunday morning, and we are going to embark on this incredible journey concerning writing for young learners. I'm so excited about this presentation. I remember I had done a similar one about three years ago, and the feedback was overwhelming. Thank you all for your love and support. Having said this, it's time to begin our presentation, Expressive Writing, and this will be a presentation that will assist our young learners of the English language, kids that are just starting to learn it, and we're talking about the ages of seven, eight, or nine. Having said this, let's uh, reflect upon the contents of this presentation. First of all, we are going to discuss when the best time is to start assisting our students into transferring their thoughts into the written form. We will further expand by talking about recommended practices and techniques that we can apply throughout the educational school year. Admittedly, not only our students, but we ourselves make mistakes. We are all human beings. So these are a few practices, techniques, and of course, advice on things that we should avoid. And finally, we're going to keep them on their toes a bit how we can influence and inspire them so that they can never lose interest, always be motivated, and try to adapt writing as a form that must be continuously refined and must be used you know throughout the whole course of their lives because writing is an expression of our thoughts and who we are as individuals having said this let us begin by focusing on the basic language skills now most of you are aware of the fact that we have listening reading which are receptive skills and of course we have writing and speaking which focus on the productive skills as you can see, since they're both productive skills, writing and speaking go hand in hand as they are inter intricately intertwined with each other, meaning that we will be making a few references to the speaking aspect. However, after my presentation, you can also watch Mr. Dimitris Primali's presentation on speaking. Okay, so having said this, let's answer the burning question. Why is writing avoided? I mean, I know a lot of teachers who avoid writing. They tell me, Catherine, I'm not going to try writing with my students yet because they're too young. Well, they think that it's too demanding for kids. Is it actually demanding? I'd say not. Because we as individuals set our goals. When we ask of them to write a whole paragraph at such an age, of course it's demanding, but that's not the case. We're not asking them to write a whole essay, okay? A whole page of um, you know, expressing their thoughts. We have to start simple with one, two sentences. That's the basis that we have to depend upon. Now, other teachers tell me that they don't have time throughout the lesson. They say that it takes up a lot of their time. And, you know, I understand because I'm a teacher myself that we have to follow the flow of the textbook. OK, we don't want to disappoint the school owner. We don't want, you know, to tell the school principal at the end of the year that we didn't finish, you know, the materials that were assigned to us, the parents who pay for the books. And, you know, there is this fear that we're not going to finish, you know, the books. So doing extra writing tasks is out of the question. Or in many cases, we avoid the writing tasks altogether. I'm sorry to say this, but writing is the cornerstone of the English language. We should never avoid these exercises. And believe me, it takes no more than two minutes to finish them. Now, another thing, we love, you know, hanging our projects on the walls and, you know, students, you know, really admire their works. So having them adorn the walls of the classroom is something that everyone wants to see. However, there are mistakes. We correct our little mistakes in their essays. And these are uh, more visible in the written than in the oral form. And this is something that it might disappoint them. However, we're going to keep mistakes to a minimum. We will inspire them and we have to help them acknowledge that we are human beings. We will be making mistakes. Now, something that a lot of teachers do, which is a huge mistake, we heavily rely on writing models. So you have the text and, you know, sometimes we tell our students, um, substitute, you know, the main objects of the text with your own. So we're going to see an example. And this is a technique that should be avoided at all costs because the teachers end up guiding them all the way. They don't, you know, develop their critical thinking. And in the end, they don't learn how to write. So in simple words, we are misusing the textbooks. Let me explain what I mean by this. I myself am an author. I've written many course books uh, for ELT. So one of the exercises that we actually add to the textbook has to do with complete the text. We give them a small text, four words, we actually give them the words and they have to fill in the blanks. So in this case, 
My favorite toy by James. This is my toy car. Okay, so they, they use the words. They're learning vocabulary. It is purple. Okay, it's the beginning of the school year. They're learning, you know, the colors. It has got four wheels. It is fast. I like my toy. Now, a lot of teachers mistakenly tell them to take this text and just change the four words, thus creating a writing of their own, but it's not their own. This is an exercise to have them familiarize themselves with a concept. And, you know, this is something that will spark their critical thinking. But in order to spark their critical thinking, this is just part of the whole procedure. Now, let's look at a second example. This is actually an essay written by a student of another teacher at the school that I work at. My favorite toy by Emma. So Emma starts writing down, you know, a similar approach to the one we just saw. This is my toy doll. Her name's Nina. That's great. She can fly. I'm actually surprised because she's using possessive adjectives. I take her to school for play. Okay, we have one mistake here, probably to play with. My girls play with Nina, probably her friends. I love her very much. Now, she's using her, my, possessive adjectives. She's using the verb can. Now, this kid has made a huge effort. Now, at the bottom of the page, I noticed the teacher, she wrote down this. You didn't write about her colors. Why, why obliterate all the effort that this student made? She made a huge effort to use so many uh, structures of the English language, and we don't even care. I mean, we shouldn't care about the two mistakes that she made. Um, I mean, not even the color that she didn't actually add because the teacher probably asked them to add colors. But that's not the idea of what we're doing here. We want them to express themselves critically and actually express their thoughts and place it into written form. This is what Emma did. And I'm very proud of her. Now, as teachers, we depend on the models very much. Why don't we actually look at what the teacher's book says? So what are we doing wrong? First of all, we're not helping them develop their critical thinking. Are we motivating them to have fun? No, because we want them to follow a specific structure. We shouldn't do that. We should have faith in our students and study the publisher's materials. Now, let me explain. The publishers who offer us our textbooks have teacher's books and they have instructions inside. In the instructions, you will be baffled if you read how many ideas they offer what to do after doing these exercises in the book, how to inspire their critical thinking, how to motivate them to have fun. And this is something that a lot of teachers unfortunately neglect. I admittedly, when I was young, I made the same mistakes. And I was like, okay, I don't need the teacher's book. And this is a huge, you know, uh, misconception. Actually, there are so many projects that they can expand their critical thought on. Let me explain. First of all, go through the book at the beginning of the school year. Check what each unit has the students express their thoughts in written form. For example, in September, the first two units, they're going to write about a toy and maybe a pet. So try to think of a project that you can assign them that has to do with either the toy or the pet. Now, try to take notes of every theme that you see throughout the year, okay? And write down the months that you're going to be focusing on these. Think of a project that you can assign your kids. And having said this, you should interview your students at the beginning of the year. Yes, I'm serious. Interview your students about their interests, their hobbies, if they read comics, sports, board games, their role models, and start taking notes. For example, Mary here, she likes Wonder Woman. And she's one of my students, actually. She likes comics, but her favorite one is Wonder Woman. John likes Batman. David plays a lot of sports and he plays basketball. He also plays board games. So I started taking notes of what my students like doing. Tiffany likes, you know, Taylor Swift a lot, the singer. And after that, I actually took it upon myself to find vocabulary to further stimulate their thoughts. So Mary, when the time comes to write about her favorite superhero, I'm going to give her the word lasso because Wonder Woman has a lasso because I'm definitely sure she's going to ask me what this thing is, the rope, okay? Or how do we say Batman puts his disguise on what we call this? It's a cowl. Or David, you know, he wears his trainers for basketball. Or he also plays board games and, you know, he throws the dice. These are words that they will need when the time comes to do their project. So, Assign them a few things that they can do. Now, 
what should we focus on? We should start focusing on activities and games which will instill entertainment, all right? We want to trigger their imagination in such a way that the students will be passionate about what they're doing. And you know what? We want progress, not refinement. In answer to the first question in the contents at the beginning of this presentation, I will just say that start writing on the first day. I'm serious. Even if it's two words, three words, one sentence, we want progress. If you're waiting for the perfect day for them to achieve the perfect command of the English language, that's never going to happen. Never. Now, we are going to start off with basic grammar and limited vocabulary. We don't want you know, to make things overcomplicated. And as I mentioned earlier, if you let this you know, um, go on until two or three years pass and not focus that much on writing, they will not be capable in later stages when they reach higher levels of the English language to follow uh, the materials that we will be teaching them. Now, having said this, children are constantly processing information. Children are learning and thinking. Having said this, they learn through social interactions. Some of your students will be passive learners. Others are going to be active ones. If a student is focusing on the lesson but he's not speaking, it's okay. If another one wants to express his thoughts in class, we should, of course, welcome that. Never reprimand a student for his way of acknowledging um, the materials or the knowledge that we will be instilling them with. Now, having said this, we will also focus on collaboration with others, a student with a teacher or students amongst themselves. One of the examples I had used three years ago, I have never used it ever since, but you know, a lot of you asked me to use this example again. You found it really, you know, um, attractive and funny. So we're going to choose a theme, the little elephant. I had actually used the elephant with my students, a junior class uh, a few years ago when we were obliged to do lessons, you know, online. Now, what aspects are we going to focus on? Prepositions, just a few, on, in, at, tenses. We can focus on present simple, maybe present continuous, and vocabulary. Now, when we're talking about vocabulary, simple words, CVC words. Think of this. Is it a virtual class? Are we going to use virtual materials? Is it going to be uh, in the classroom itself? Are we going to be using printed materials? Even though I must admit that most classrooms around the world now have, you know, uh, technology assigned and, you know, available to them at their disposal. Having said this, we have to keep them motivated and have, you know, them inspired nonstop. It's a constant factor that we should not neglect. Having said this, when we finish one part of the exercise, move on to the next one. Keep them on their toes all the time. So we're going to spark their imagination with prepositions. The first ones that they learn on, under, in, we're going to do CVC words, consonant, vowel, consonant. And of course, we're going to let them draw the theme in humorous ways, or if it's online, download a picture. Something that I wanted to state here is that a lot of schools offer their students tablets or even laptops. Now, Am I in favor of this? Yes, I am in favor of this because we should use technology as an instrument to further expand upon, you know, the teachings and the techniques we use in class. Unfortunately, yes, there are going to be some kids who will be struggling to find ways to fool around with the equipment they have at their disposal. If this is the case, it's up to the educator to see how he will, you know, um, handle the situation and limit their interaction with the computers. First of all, I found this picture. I gave this picture to my kids and they were excited because we were going to do a lesson about elephants. And I told them, come on guys, I'm going to give you a few seconds or even a minute. Write sentences, what is going on in this picture? So they grabbed their pencils, they were going crazy. They loved it because this is like a bull in a china shop. So one of my students, very proud of this one, said that the elephant is in the kitchen. They started learning you know, the words um, that have to do with the home in the kitchen, correct use of preposition. Another kid wrote a big elephant or the elephant is in the house. Wonderful. So this is their first you know, attempt at writing. One simple sentence. Okay, so I'm like, let's try another one. I found this other picture. I posted it on the board. I asked them, come on guys, I'll give you a minute. Tell me, what is the elephant doing here? So my students wrote, the elephant is on a tree. 
which is not exactly a mistake if you think about it, but it's not perfect. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to reprimand them. I will praise what they just did and applaud the effort. Great, guys, you did a good job, but let's make this sentence a little better. So how are we going to help them improve the work? We have to explain a few factors to them. First of all, as we understand, this isn't exactly a tree. It's a log. Okay, so we have the elephant who is sitting on a log. And I'm like, hmm, this is a perfect opportunity for them to learn a new word. So Google uh, a tree, Google a lump, uh, a log, or even a tree stump, something, so that they can see the visual differences. Now, students heavily rely on audio, um, stimulation, video, kinesthetic. There's so many ways of approaching and inspiring your students to express themselves. So having seen the two pictures, they understood the, the difference. So the students are going to start using the word log, a CVC word. Now, we're going to combine what we're going to do now with some speaking. I started asking them question words. What is the elephant doing? And I'm stressing the ING form on purpose because I want them to use the ING form. What is the elephant doing? So the kids answered, the elephant is sitting. Okay, so they catch it right away that this is happening now. We have present continuous. The elephant is sitting. Where is the elephant sitting? I ask them another question word. And they answer, the elephant is sitting on the log. Oh my God, what did they just do? They use the correct tense. Present continuous is sitting. A preposition on. A new CVC word, log. The elephant is sitting on the log. So with this simple exercise that took us less than a minute, the students actually implemented three uh, grammar, two grammar phenomenon and one new vocabulary word in the sentence. Very proud of them. Now, we want to enhance their curiosity. I've said this before, I'm in favor of animated GIFs or GIFs. I've heard both, you know, uh, words used. This one is an elephant, you know, wagging its tail. And, you know, my students in their mother tongue started saying, um, the elephant, you know, is moving the tail. And I'm like, guys, we don't use the same word um, in English for moving the tail. We use another word. So my students asked me, what verb do we use for move its tail? And I told them, wag, CVC word. Okay, we're trying to inspire them with new words and things that they can use because they are curious and they want, you know, to further expand about what they are using. And they correctly said, the elephant is wagging its tail. Very proud of them. Now, we should never um, obscure, you know, their train of thought. We should never preconceive what they're going to talk about. Now, their perceptive skills, honestly, as a teacher, I've seen students express themselves in a variety of ways. They've baffled me many a time. So you, you never know what to expect from kids. Don't respect, restrict them with specific vocabulary. I remember when I found this picture, I was about to tell them, okay, we're going to use the word dance, which would have been a huge mistake. But one of my students said, the elephant is wearing a hat. So try to um, not be that expressive in class. Have them ponder upon the sentence that they are going to use. Have them think about the vocabulary that they're going to implement. Don't offer them, you know, the words beforehand um, if you're sure that they know them already. Okay, so what have we achieved on an educational level? First of all, we've practiced grammar structures, which is great. We practice new vocabulary, log and wag, and we develop their critical thinking. And of course, expression of thoughts through the productive skills. Now, of course, while in the class, a lot of students exchange ideas. One of the students said that he's wearing a hat. The other one said that it's dancing. Maybe another student could have said that he is smiling or he's happy. So this stimulation goes back and forth throughout, you know, the class. On a personal level, okay, the students have their self-esteem boosted because they figured it out on their own. Secondly, they're experimenting with new ideas and I like it when students express themselves. I don't want it when, you know, some of our kids uh, feel like they're going to be reprimanded if they're going to make a mistake when they're expressing themselves. Please, and I'm asking this as an educator, we're all educators, let them express themselves freely. 
Even if it's something that we might deem ridiculous to them, it's expressing their thoughts and we should never ever um, burn that desire from within them. Now, by doing so, we will further um, enhance the trust between their uh, peers and of course, towards our person, the teacher. Now, I am in favor of using pictures a lot because a picture will reinforce the concept of what we're doing. And you know what? We should adopt various approaches to doing this. You know, use audio, use visual. In this case, I, I found this picture. We have a child wig. Okay, she's wearing a wig. And I told my kids, this is a new word, a CBC word, W-I-G. And we can also refer to the bow on top of the head and further expand upon it, asking, how is she feeling? Okay, she's happy. What is she holding? All right, so we're using question words. We're using, you know, uh, grammar tenses. You're stimulating their thought. And you can then ask them, where is she going? Okay, and you can get a multitude of responses from the kids just by one simple picture. And this is what we mean by audiovisual kinesthetic elements. This is what will immerse your students in the writing experience and what we want to reap from the lesson. Speaking of visual stimulation, there are so many picture stories that you can use. You can find them for free online. And of course, a picture story, be it three, four, five panels, can inspire your students to express themselves. Let's have a look at this. This is actually a sample from one Wiley test from Cambridge. You can download it online. And we have a story here that is in progress. What I like about this story is, first of all, you can inspire your kids to work on their vocabulary. So you have some verbs like lift, because your students will ask you in their mother tongue, how do we say lift? Or, you know, drop in this case. Or open the box. That you have so many verbs. In the fourth panel, you can also express the feelings of agony. Okay, that they're worried, they're sad, they're um, anxious. Or in the last picture, you can express their emotions of happiness, relief, Okay, and give them simple words that they can use. A story, when it's presented in visual form, can be connected with an idea. This idea can be better implemented and transferred into written form. Okay, so we need stimulation from a various of um, sources. And as I said, a picture is worth a thousand words. You have no idea how many things you can do with one simple picture. I presented this picture in class and I asked them, what do you see in this picture? And they said, oh, we can see kids, you know, playing with a lot of balls. And I asked them, did you see the white balls? And they were like, which white balls? And they counted three white balls. Oh, okay, so how are the kids feeling? They're happy. Okay, I want you to write two sentences or three sentences, whatever you want, okay. Where they are, why, I, why are they there? And what are they doing? Okay, question words. We want a lot of question words. So they grabbed their pencils and they made up the craziest of stories. I, I honestly enjoyed what they wrote down. And to be honest, each student wrote a different story. One said that they were at a party and they got lost in the balls. Or, you know, another one that they were at a game show and they won the first prize and it started raining, you know, these balls. It was impressive, to say the least. Okay. Now, having said this, there are some issues that students might be facing, you know, when learning the language. First of all, oral and written execution is different. Okay, we understand this. And, you know, sentence fragments are usually used in oral. Let me expand upon this. You ask someone, did you eat anything? Yeah. What did you eat? A sandwich. So they usually in, you know, oral form, we answer by using one or two words maximum. And this is a part of, you know, our everyday spoken language. Now, there's another issue that we have run-ons leading to no punctuation. Now, let me explain this. In many cases, um, you have someone who starts, you know, describing his day. So a child, for instance, I went to the park and we played with our friends and then we bought some ice cream and we had a fantastic time. Okay, so no commas, no full stops, nothing. And this is a problem that students have when they're expressing themselves in written form. First of all, one technique that we teachers, many of us fail to implement in class has to do with modeling. What is this? You start off by writing a sentence on the board. The flower is red. 
when you start writing on the board, the, capital T, because it's the beginning of the sentence, we have to dictate the instructions so that the students can understand what we're doing. The flower is red, full stop. And while you're dotting on the board, you have to stress the fact that you're placing a full stop. New sentence, I, capital I, ate a cookie, dot, okay, the full stop. And this is how you make them understand that, yes, these rules are important and we need full sentences. Now, sentence frames. I am in favor of sentence frames. Why? Because we're talking about formulaic language. I like to swim. I like to dance. I like to draw. There are expressions, formulaic language, that they can adapt. And after exposing the students two or three times to these sentences, it will become a part of their language. Now, Another sentence, a bit more complex, you can switch around question words. What is your favorite toy? Okay. When is your favorite TV show on? All right, et cetera, et cetera. And by having the student work on these formulaic uh, language expressions, he will have them integrated into his own. Now, let's move on. Something that I want to stress very much because I hate it when people call students weak or strong. There are no weak students. There are no strong students. There are students of different abilities and or educational needs. I want you to know this. Never call a student strong or weak. It's a huge, um, you know what? I'll be honest. It's an insult to our fellow human beings. Now, having said this, it's a good idea to have them paired and experiment on assigning roles. For example, you have three kids and you want them to do a writing task. One might be very good at speaking. The other might be very good at research. And the other one is really good at writing. So having said this, by combining these three elements together, you will have the perfect environment for students to exchange opinions, to be stimulated by one another. And afterwards, you can you know, switch the roles and have the person who is not that much in favor of doing research, but he will do it eventually, having seen his fellow student do it and maybe adapting or adopting you know, a few techniques to further improve his own skills. Now, differentiation is the key word here, people. Differentiate on the output with an or presentation through the written task. So for example, if you have the three of them working together and producing a written task, one of them or maybe three of them can present it orally, okay, in front of the other students. Now, by combining the productive skills, speaking and writing, you can achieve an amalgamation of, of the output. What does this mean? Someone that is better at writing, okay, can also improve his uh, speaking skills and vice versa. Okay, now... There are a few more demanding tasks. Is something like this feasible? Yes, it is. I don't want you know, our students or even teachers to be daunted about what they can offer their kids. First of all, I will present a few techniques here that you should always keep in mind when you're doing a writing task in class. Brainstorming for ideas, first of all, concepts and themes. Okay, what's a concept? A superhero, or maybe a visit to the beach. Offer words and phrases for integration in writing. We're going to be talking about word maps and I really like this because you have a collection of words that have to do with one specific theme. We'll see this shortly. And of course, set goals regarding the number of details and ideas. Now, what do we mean by this? So that students don't get frustrated. Oh my God, we have to write a whole essay. Ask them to write two ideas. Okay, two sentences. And if they can do that, they can do three afterwards and so on. Let's start with the first one, brainstorming. So, Let's say we have a superhero. What can our superhero do? So our kids start, you know, raising their hands. Uh, he can jump or fly or lift. Okay, I helped them with one of them, run fast. And you know what? They produce these awesome sentences. My superhero can run fast and lift cars. He can fly in the sky. And I'm like, wow, my students are amazing because they believed in themselves. We offered them a bit of stimulation and, you know, they actually pulled it off. Now, sometimes some of our students get really enthusiastic. How do we say this teacher? You know, they ask us in their mother tongue because they're really excited. I'm not in favor of guiding students in such a way that we, the teachers, write the essay for them. However, if it's genuine enthusiasm and they want to learn the word, if you give it to them, they will remember it and we should offer them this new enriched uh, further vocabulary. 
There's a thin line between enthusiasm though and pampering. If a student is bored and there's some sort of vocabulary that you've already explained in the past, but he hasn't implemented, you can kindly ask the student to go back in his textbook to find the word or ask the rest of the class, do you guys remember how we say, for example, pick something up like lift and you know, they'll raise their hands, etc. So if they're enthusiastic, give them a few more words. If they ask you, how do we save people? Save people, or what is he wearing in the back? He's wearing a cape. And yes, this is something I applaud to further stimulate them. Now, I refer to word mats. They are so helpful, not only for the vocabulary, but it develops critical thinking and inspires them. Look at this one on the right um, side of the slide. We have some words that they probably know. Umbrella, okay, this is easy. The sea, a swimsuit, a boat. But what about some other words that you usually don't see at this age? You have spade. You have, for example, the pier. And of course, you can create a whole story based on this. So I took my bucket and my spade and built this huge sand castle. Or we, we jumped uh, from the pier with our friends, and we were swimming in the water. You can't imagine what kind of stories your students can actually develop if you give them a word mat. Now, there are some word mats that have, you know, groups of uh, vocabulary without this detailed description, you know, with pictures. But either one of them is great because the one on the left has, you know, the pictures, uh, the individual pictures of the vocabulary. The one on the right has a huge illustration of a beach and the hills. These are all free to use. There are so many sites that offer, you know, these word mats for free. I highly advise you to um, use them in class with your kids. So this is group vocabulary based on specific themes, inspiration, and of course it enriches their vocabulary. Now, I love postcards. I always use postcards with my kids in class. Why do I do this? First of all, you know, you can actually buy a few postcards or you can print them, maybe have the students draw them, it's okay. Students have this idea that they're easy to write. Okay, I'm just gonna write one sentence, okay? Because they see that there are like only one or two lines to fill out and it's mostly a drawing, that's what they think. But it stimulates imaginary situations. Where are you, Mary? I'm in New York, as we can see here in the postcard. Okay, send this postcard to your parents or your best friend. Where are you going? To the Statue of Liberty. So we're going to Google how we write Statue of Liberty and you know, Words like um, sail on the boat or climb the ladder uh, to the torch, etc. Now, we're also going to refer to birthday cards or celebrations and parties. This is another form of postcard, to say the least. Okay, it's another form of card that you can have a birthday invitation or, you know, invite someone to a party. These are really good ideas for kids to start using the language that they have at their disposal. Okay, now the next one is a touchy subject. I have met school owners who do not um, endorse dictation in their schools. They never work on this. I know that a lot of teachers have different opinions on the matter. Personally, I'm in favor of, dicta of dictation. This is something that is highly debatable and we can talk about you know, later on uh, in the comments or in the Q&A. First of all, in my opinion, dictation accelerates writing and spelling skills. However, I'm not in favor of long dictation that doesn't always make for a better dictation, as we know, and tiring the students, because one form of dictation that we can use is to write the words down and, you know, have them, you know, use them in sentences later on to expand upon their creative thinking. Another way now that we are going to uh, observe here in this presentation is about learning how to write without learning things by heart. I admit that I am horrible at learning things by heart. My rote learning capabilities are very limited. So this is actually um, a technique that I learned from Herbert Bukta. You can actually see it in one of his Cambridge videos, his tutorials. I have them in the resource links at the end of this presentation. It's called a visual dictation. You help them memorize orthography through visual dictation activities. In his video, he was holding a piece of paper, which he showed to the others for like 10 seconds, and then he hid it away. So at the beginning, when students start learning the language, you should avoid auditory dictations, at least initially. And you know what? Show them a card, Apple. It also might have, you know, illustration on it. And you know, the kids, after seeing it for 10 seconds, they will remember it, they'll write it down, and then you can ask them to put it in a sentence as well. And thus, you will improve your writing capabilities by adding the new word learned 
through dictation in a sentence using it to its fullest capacity. Okay, now, a lot of kids, you know, had me their uh, assignments, their writing tasks, and they're like, teacher, I finished. I'm like, really, in 10 seconds? How did you do that? Did you check what you just wrote? Mm, not really. Okay, please check it and bring it back to me. Now, is proofreading necessary at such a young age? Yes, they have to process and evaluate what they have written. It's... It's about adopting you know, functional professional habits because later on in their lives when they become professionals and they're working for a company, okay, and they have clients to cater to, they should be professional in the uh, presentation that they are going to deliver and the offers that they're going to extend. So this instills a sense of responsibility. Always ask your students to double check what they write before they hand it in. And believe me, most of my kids start, you know, using their rubber and, you know, correcting mistakes or even adding information. I remember some of my students when I tell them just this. I mean, do you have anything else to add? And they're like, hmm, yeah, I can add a few more things. <laughs> and they start writing again. And I love it. I love it because they are actually challenging their, themselves into, you know, further expanding upon what they just delivered. Okay, so first of all, as teachers, admittedly, we gain a lot of things from these, um, uh, you know, writing activities. I am in favor of writing because I can diagnose the flaws or the weaknesses as regards structure, vocabulary, spelling. There are so many things that we can see in one simple sentence of a student, thus helping the student, you know, overcome these obstacles, these difficulties that he's facing, be it, you know, dictation or lack of vocabulary or even grammar. It enables creativity in such a way that you allow your student to freely express himself. And this is what we want. And I want everyone to keep in mind that writing is also a catalyst for consolidating the key elements of the lesson at the end of the unit. You know, you're fully aware of the fact that writings are usually added at the end of each unit in a textbook. Why do we do this? Because we want consolidation. First, they learn the grammar, the vocabulary. We move on to other productive skills like speaking. You have listening, which is a receptive skill. And you put all of these together at the end into the writing. And you can, you know, actually do um, a consolidation at the end of each unit by, uh, you know, repeating everything that you've done and revising the materials that you have at your disposal. Okay. Now, as for the students, um, I do have some students that are really fast and, you know, they deliver their assignments right away. And I always have a few extra tasks ready for the ones that do because we don't want them just standing around. If they're capable of delivering such a writing task, give them another one. This shows how much we appreciate them. I know at first they might be nagging, oh no, I don't wanna write anything else, but if you do actually give them the writing, they will start you know, expanding upon it because they wanna to prove to you what they can do and they might even have different ideas to show off. And one thing that I would like to stress is to have them examine the accuracy of their writing. Okay. Um, it's what I said earlier, proofreading. If you think that the student is overconfident, it's a good idea to have them re-examine it. Not that we can find fault in his writings because it's no one is perfect. No one is perfect. And we want them to understand this. That's better to be careful than to um, uh, further, you know, find problems in your writing later on that might, you know, bring you to a, in a difficult position. Okay. Providing visuals for stimulation. This is something that we should always do. Okay, I showed you some examples. Pictures always stimulate, you know, their minds. Engaging topics. We want them to be invested in what they're doing. Yes, we must rely on the topics of the textbook. However, adding a few uh, elements of our own, you know, spicing things up is not a bad idea. Group tasks. I mentioned earlier, working together as a team. And of course, encourage class presentations. A student who might have difficulties in writing might be better um, equipped to face this challenge by speaking in class and presenting his ideas orally. Thus, later on, trying to uh, transfer these um, abilities and ideas into the written form. Okay, now this is something that um, I found in one of you know uh, Herbert Puchta's you know videos. He found a quote by Jane Hyatt Yolen: "Exercise the writing muscle every day." Even if it's only a letter, notes, a title list, a character sketch, journal entry, 
Riders are like dancers, like athletes. Without that exercise, the muscles seize up. Riding is a skill that must be refined. It's an ever going, you know, procedure. It never stops. We further develop it as we grow older. I remember here in ELT News, we had the honor of having Stephen Crashing um, speak for one of our sessions here. And I remember him saying that he would write anything every day. For example, even if it's a small paragraph, a little article, even if it's an email, he um, wrote on purpose something every day. Because if he stopped writing, he was scared that he would start, you know, um, degrading, to say the least. And this is something that I inspire my students as well. You should never stop writing. Okay, having said this, uh, you can scan uh, the QR code, and this will lead you to a link in my blog, katherineriley.blog, and you can find this presentation file there. You can download it for free. Scan the code. If the code does not lead you to the link, copy the text, add it to your Google browser, and of course, it will lead you there directly. Thank you to ELT News for offering me this opportunity to present my ideas to all of you. Please uh, follow me on social media, you know, add a like or anything you want. Here's another QR code for you to visit my social media handles. And of course, I wish you a pleasant afternoon. Thank you all for your time.